Today I want to speak about a person, you know, by Allah, numbers never scared him. Europe threw everything that they had at him, but they couldn't scare him. And the testimony to the greatness of this man is that every single person claimed him. Even his arch enemies claimed him. When the news of his bravery and compassion reached Europe, they couldn't believe that a non-white, non-Christian man could be so brave and so compassionate. And Salahuddin was born in the fort of Tikrit. And his mother mentioned that when I was pregnant with Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi, I saw a dream that in my stomach, I have a sword from the swords of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And Salahuddin from a very early age, he became a hafid of the Quran. He was a Shafi in fiqh and he memorized Kitab al tanbih of the Shafi school of fiqh. And his greatest aspiration in life was to become a scholar. He loved the scholar. Throughout his life, the men that he respected the most were the ulama. And this is why Shaykh Abul Hassan Nadwi Rahmatullah Alayhi, he said Salahuddin was a Muslim. He was a Muhammadi. He was a Mu'min. The only language that he understood was the language of the Quran. The only language that he understood was the language of Islam and Iman. Salahuddin was still young. Then he had the honor of being tutored by a man regarding who Ibn Athir Rahmatullah Alayhi says, I have studied the lives of the Khulafa and I've studied the lives of all the kings. And since the Khulafa Rashid Dun and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the Muslims never had a man who was as upright and caring and compassion as Nuruddin Zinki Rahmatullah Alayhi. Meaning for 450 years, the Muslims never had a man like Nuruddin Zinki Rahmatullah Alayhi. And Salahuddin would say that Nuruddin is my master. He modeled himself on Nuruddin. And also Nuruddin realized the potential in Salahuddin. And this is why when in Damascus crime became rife, he made Salahuddin at a very tender age in charge of the entire police of Damascus. And then Salahuddin worked on the people and he brought peace back to Damascus. And after a while, when Salahuddin grew up somewhat, the Crusaders attacked Egypt. And what a deed the Caliph in Egypt did is that he cut the hair of his wife and he sent it to Nuruddin. And this meant that we can no longer look after our women, assist us. And Nuruddin Rahmatullah didn't want to assist them because see the Aladid and the Egyptians were Fatimites. The Fatimites were Shias and they were not only Shia, they were a very decadent nation. But Shirku, the uncle of Salahuddin convinced him. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi says, when my uncle came to me to take me to Egypt, I didn't want to go. One, because his aspirations was to become a scholar. But second, he mentions, you know, I thought I was going to die. As Allah says, you know, in the Quran, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ It is a possibility that you will dislike something, but there's good in it for you. And by Allah, Salahuddin going, there was good for the Ummah. And Shirku rid Egypt of the Crusaders. And shortly after this, Adid remained the Caliph, but Shirku became second in charge. After a while, Shirku passed away. And the ulama and the fuqaha, they chose Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayh in the place of Shirku. And therefore, Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayh became the second most powerful man in Egypt. He was only 32 at the time. And Salahuddin showed what a real leader should be. He removed all the taxes which were contrary to Sharia. He established Sunni madrasas. By the time Al Adid was passing away, Salahuddin made an announcement from now Egypt will be Sunni. The historians mention no two rams locked horns, meaning nobody disagreed because, see, the people loved Salahuddin. He won their heart. He was a true leader. He showed love and compassion to people. And that love and compassion was reciprocated. And Ibn Murrah mentioned, he said, I swear by Allah, if Salahuddin had been given the entire dunya to spend in the path of Allah, it would have not been enough for him. His treasurers would never tell him how much they had in the treasury because he would spend it all. And the historians mentioned, that Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi never in his life did he turn away a beggar. Never in his life, listen to this, never in his life did he ride a horse, but he had already promised to give it to somebody else. The palace that Adid left behind him, there was nothing like it in the world. It had 4,000.
thousand rooms, twelve thousand occupants, and besides his direct family, all the occupants were women, and Salahuddin refused to move in it. It is the barakah of Salahuddin rahmatullah alayhi that today Egypt is Sunni. Egypt had been Shia for over 280 years. Al Azhar, the oldest Muslim university, had been Shia for over 200 years. And it was Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi who brought him back into Sunniism. Now, after Nuruddin passed away, Syria just fragmented. All the princes were only interested in their little fiefdom. And they began to side with the Crusaders to fight other princes. They were actually giving annual tributes to the Crusaders. And the people of Syria were disgusted because they were used to a man like Nuruddin, a powerful, charismatic man. And the people of Syria, they turned to Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi. And this was the time that Salahuddin started on his expeditions. Now, after Nuruddin passed away, Syria just fragmented. All the princes were only interested in their little fiefdom. And they began to side with the Crusaders to fight other princes. They were actually giving annual tributes to the Crusaders. And the people of Syria were disgusted because they were used to a man like Nuruddin, a powerful, charismatic man. And the people of Syria, they turned to Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi. And this was the time that Salahuddin started on his expeditions. Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi spent longer, understand this, he spent longer fighting Muslims than he did non-Muslims. He fought with Muslims for over 10 years because he understood that if you are divided, you are weak and you are susceptible to invasion. But if you are united, you are strong. And for over 10 years, he fought with other Muslims to unite them. And the other Muslim rulers said to Salahuddin, they said, oh Salahuddin, we will give you money, go back. And Salahuddin said, how can I unite with you people? How can I negotiate with you people when you are in one valley and I am in another valley? The valley that he attributed to them was the value of this dunya, the value of preserving their kingdoms. While the value that he attributed to himself was the value which led to the akhirah, the value of preserving this ummah. And the amazing thing was that the Muslim leaders united with the Crusaders to fight Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi. And they released a man who was the greatest arch enemy of Islam, a man called Reginald de Chatillon. For 15 years, this man had been in prison. Nuruddin had left him in the dungeons of Halab. They released him so he would be a thorn in the side of Salahuddin. And what did this man do? Soon as he mustered up an army, he marched on Makkah. And Na'udhu Billah, he was saying, when I reach Makkah, I will bring the Kaaba to the ground. And then Na'udhu Billah, he said, I will go to Medina. And Na'udhu Billah, I will take the camel herder from his grave, speaking about the Prophet Sallallahu And I will bring him back to my palace in Karuk. And I will charge the Muslims to view his body. And the narrations mention that when Salahuddin heard this, he took out his sword, he lifted it to the skies. And he said, by Allah, I will kill Reginald with my own hands because he had a deep love for the Prophet and he dispatched an army under Husamuddin Lutlu and Husamuddin took a navy he annihilated the army of Reginald and then he captured his men he took him to Medina and he executed him in Medina and four years after this again when the Muslims and the Christians had a truce Reginald attacked a Muslim caravan traveling from Egypt to Syria. And what he would do every time he would put a Muslim to the sword, he would say, you believe in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now ask him to help you. And then he would strike his neck. And when Salahuddin heard this, he again took an oath that he would kill this man with his own hands. And it was upon this occasion that Salahuddin brought forth an army. And this is the famous battle, the battle of Hittin. And the Crusaders brought forth an army. And when Salahuddin consulted his men, he said, what shall we do? Shall we carry on attacking their forts and their castles? Or shall we have a head on confrontation? And they said, carry on attacking their forts. And Salahuddin said, no. He said, we will take him head on. Because none of us knows how long he's going to live. And matters run by what Allah decrees, not what we desire. And each one of us should expend himself. And then he said, oh my men, fight to please your Lord. Do not fight to please me. 
and they marched on to the army of the crusaders. The crusader army was considerably larger than the Muslim army. When they reached there, the crusader army was deeply entrenched and they had barricaded themselves. So Salahuddin Rahmatullah didn't rush. He showed what a military genius he was. What he did, he went to a nearby fort and this fort had the women and the children of the soldiers there and he lay siege to it. And then he put his back against the sea. Now, the Christian charges were very strong. The Muslims had problem dealing with Christian charges. But tactically, the Muslims were far superior. So what the Christians thought was one charge and Salahuddin will end up in the sea. And this is exactly what Salahuddin wanted them to think. So the next morning, they marched. Midsummer, and what Salahuddin Rahmatullah did, he had put archers on the way. And what he did, he poisoned all the wells. When they began to march, these archers began to shower arrows. So many arrows, so many arrows, that their movements became snail pace. The march should have taken them eight hours. But by sunset, they were miles away from their destination and thousands of them had perished. And they thought might would bring them relief. But the historians mention that Salahuddin Rahmatullah's men had encircled them in a manner that not even an ant could go through. And they mentioned there were two different cries from two different camps because all night the arrows carried on coming. So from the Muslim camp, there were the cries of Takbir Allah Akbar. And from the Christian camp, there were the cries of the dying and the wounded. And overnight, Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi bought 400 camels laden with arrows, another 70 waiting. Water was plentiful. The Christians had no water. And next morning, Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi noticed that the brushwood was dry and the wind was blowing in the direction of the crusaders. So it's midsummer, no water, and they lit the brushwood. And then now they began to choke on the smoke as well. And it was here that the Muslims attacked. And they were reciting the verse, And indeed it is a right upon us that we assist the believers. And then Salahuddin wanted to afflict the final psychological blow. And that was to capture the true cross. It was believed as long as they have this cross, they can never lose a battle. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah sent the entire regiment to capture it. And when the regiment captured it, this totally demoralized the Christian and they fell by the wayside and only 150 of them remained standing. And the Muslims attacked. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah was watching this and his brother was standing next to him. And he said, Alhamdulillah, we have defeated them. And Salahuddin said, not yet. And then he attacked again. And the Christians went back and his brother said, Alhamdulillah, we have defeated them. And Salahuddin said, wait, not yet. When that tent falls, the tent of the king, then we have defeated them. And when Salahuddin Rahmatullah was saying this, the tent fell. And what did Salahuddin do? Did he jump up and down? He descended from his mount and he went into sajda because he understood that victory and defeat is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Dhahbi says something profound here. He says, this was the greatest victory for the Muslims in Shah since Khalid bin Walid defeated the Romans at the battle of Yarmouk. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah didn't ease up here. Two days later, he was in Acre North. Then they took Turan, Haifa, Arsuf, Beirut, Nablus. And then Salahuddin Rahmatullah the reason he took all the ports but so the crusaders could not get any more reinforcements in. And then Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi marched on his greatest aim in life. And that was the liberation of the holy places. And they mentioned that Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi would very rarely laugh, smile. And somebody asked him, you know, you're the king of Egypt, Syria, Yemen, Lebanon. You would very rarely smile. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi said, how can I smile? How can food and water taste good to me when Bayt al-Maqdis is in the hands of the crusaders. I wonder what Salahuddin would say if he was here today. I wonder what he would say about the Muslims and their apathy towards the holy lands today. And the astrologers had told Salahuddin, they said, oh Salahuddin, we have seen in the stars that if you try to take Jerusalem, you will lose an eye. And Salahuddin said, you talking about me losing an eye? I swear by Allah, I will take the holy lands even if it means I walk into Jerusalem blind. And then for five days, Salahuddin went around Jerusalem until on the 20th of Rajab, they found an ideal place to lay siege. And for six days, they pounded the city. 
And on the 26th, Balian came out to ask for terms. And Salahuddin said, no. Salahuddin said, I offered you terms. Initially, you didn't take them. Now the city is mine. And then Balian said, if you do not offer us terms, then we will kill the 5,000 Muslims in the city and we will destroy the masjid. And really, this is a testimony to the greatness of Salahuddin Rahmatullah He could have easily said, do it, do it. And when we take it, you will see what we do to your men, women and children. But he knew that these Muslims had been at the front line for 88 years. They had suffered for 88 years and he didn't want them to go through any more suffering. And Salahuddin gave valiant terms. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah he entered Jerusalem on the very day that the Prophet Sallallahu entered Jerusalem where Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala records in the Quran Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa Pure is he who took his servant from Makkah to Jerusalem This was on the 27th of Rajab Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi entered Jerusalem on the 27th of Rajab and can you imagine how the Muslim must have felt when they entered? Can you imagine 88 years of persecution? They must have remembered the stories of how living Muslims were catapulted over the walls of Jerusalem 88 years. When they saw the Christian women, they must have remembered how every single Muslim woman was violated 88 years ago. When they entered and they saw the Christian children, they must have remembered the stories of how babies were snatched from their mother's breast and their heads were smashed against the walls. 70,000 Muslims were killed in the masjid in one day until their blood was running up to the knees of those who were doing the butchering. All these memories must have come back to the Muslims. But Salahuddin Rahmatullah had a greater memory in the back of his mind. And that was when the Prophet ﷺ re-entered Mecca. After 13 years of persecution, the Muslims migrated to Medina. And then after 10 days, they were walking into Mecca. And today, they were the conquerors. On one instruction, thousands of heads could have been removed from their body. And can you imagine how the Muslim must have felt when they entered back into Mecca? They must have seen the place where Bilal was dragged until his skin would peel from his body. They must have seen that place where Huba would be made to lie until the flesh on his back would melt. They must have seen that place where two young girls, Lubaina and Unaysa, were killed for what? Because they believed in La ilaha illallah. They must have seen the place where Ammar, Yasir, Sumayya, the entire family would be persecuted. They must have seen all these places. And in the heat of the moment, a Sahabi shouted out, Al Yomu Yomul Malhama. Today is the day of bloodshed. Today is the day of retribution. And the Prophet ﷺ heard this and he said, Oh Saad, come here, change that cry into Al Yomu Yomul Marhama. Today is the day of mercy. Today is the day of forgiveness. And similarly, Stanley Lane Poole mentioned in his classic that the Muslim king showed the Christians the meaning of compassion. Salahuddin in this early battle only killed one man and 200 Templars. And that man was after the battle of Hittin. Who was it? Reginald de Chatillon. After the battle, they erected a tent for Salahuddin. The king was brought to Salahuddin and Salahuddin gave him some water to drink with his lapping. And then he drank the water and he gave it to Reginald. And Salahuddin became angry. He said, you gave it to him. I didn't give it to him. Because if you gave somebody water, this was an indication you've given him protection in the Arab world. And then Salahuddin Rahmatullah walked up to Reginald and he reminded him of his transgressions. And he reminded him of what he said about the Prophet Sallallahu And Reginald said that this is what kings have always been doing. And Salahuddin offered him Islam and he refused. And then Salahuddin said, do you know who I am? He said, I am the representative of the Prophet Sallallahu And I on this world take revenge on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu And then he fulfilled his promise. And then he put 200 other knights to the sword who were the Knight Templars and Hospitallers. And these men, Knights had taken an oath that they would wipe this earth clean of the infidel Muslims. And Salahuddin said that he would cleanse the earth from them. And he killed 200, put 200 knights to the sword. And Stanley Lane Poole mentioned that when Salahuddin 
came into Jerusalem, he showed the Christians the meaning of compassion. And then Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi, he entered the masjid. You know, can you imagine after 88 years, the Muslims are now entering the masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make that day that we also enter it without it being besieged by the Zionists. Erno, the Christian chronicle of that time mentioned that when the Christians saw the compassion of Salahuddin, many of them embraced Islam. And then a group of women came to Salahuddin and their husband had been captured in earlier battles. And they said, oh Salahuddin, what life do we have without our husbands? And Salahuddin freed all of them. And then his brother asked for a thousand captives. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah gave him a thousand captives and he freed them. And then Salahuddin Rahmatullah said, you will see my generosity. And he said, whoever cannot pay the ransom, he goes to the back gate of Jerusalem. And the historian mentioned that so many people gathered that it was impossible to count them. And Salahuddin left them all go free. And even on this occasion, Salahuddin didn't forget his teacher Nuruddin. Nuruddin Rahmatullah had a pulpit made for the day that Masjid Al-Aqsa is liberated and the pulpit be placed in the masjid. And when Europe had heard that their holy lands had been taken from them, really, Europe went to blaze. Pope Urban II died out of grief. And I say, Subhanallah Salahuddin, you broke the backs of tyrants thousands of miles away. And when Europe had heard that their holy lands had been taken from them, really, Europe went to blaze. Pope Urban II died out of grief. And I say, Subhanallah Salahuddin, you broke the backs of tyrants thousands of miles away. And then the subsequent Pope wrote a letter to all the kings that they should send every able person to fight. Richard, Philip, they bought 600,000 men. And Salahuddin was amazed at the zeal of Christendom. He wrote letters to all the Muslim leaders. Nobody obliged. And 600,000 crusaders camped at Acre. And what they did is that they made trenches around them and then they barricaded themselves in. So Salahuddin Rahmatullah could have attacked them from behind. And for two years, Salahuddin remained in the field. And Salahuddin wasn't just a warrior. Ibn Shaddad mentions, and he accompanied Salahuddin for years. He says, Salahuddin for years, never missed Salah with Jamaat. He didn't live next to the Jami Masjid. He didn't live in a palace. He lived on a tent in the battlefield. One night before the battle, he was inspecting his men. And the Hajjud time, they were sleeping. And the definition of the Sahaba was what? They were men who would pray at night and be on their horsebacks during the day. And at the Hajjud time, these people were sleeping. And Salahuddin said, wake up, wake up. For you people will make us lose the battle. Because he wanted his men to be like the Sahaba. And we can't wake up for Fajr. And we talk about victory. When we see the suffering of our Muslim brothers and sisters, we can't put our hands in our pockets. And we can't even give our zakat and we're talking about victory. When it's Hajj time, we're not ready yet. But we want Allah to be ready to assist us. Since when did you become Allah and Allah become your servant? And Ibn Shaddad Rahmatullah says, Salahuddin, he would cry at the apathy of the Muslim leaders. By Allah, we cry at the apathy of the Muslim leaders today. All those problems which existed in the time of Salahuddin, all exist today. The only thing different is that there is no Salahuddin to bring the Ummah together. There were three Khalifs in the time of Salahuddin. Does anybody know the name of any one of those Khalifs? But history remembers Salahuddin because he cared. When they lived in their palaces, where did Salahuddin live? He lived in a tent. Ibn Shaddad Rahmatullah mentioned, he said, one night I saw Salahuddin. He couldn't sleep the whole night. He was in so much pain. The whole night he was tossing and turning. But morning came at the crack of dawn. Salahuddin mounted his horse and he did not descend until sunset. When others had big meals in their palaces, Ibn Shaddad mentioned for three days, Salahuddin ate nothing. When others lived with their families in their palaces, Salahuddin was on the battlefield. He was dodging arrows. 
Ibn Shaddad mentioned that one day the news came that Salahuddin brother had passed away. Then his nephew had passed away and he began to cry. And we didn't know why he was crying, but we began to cry with him. But he says, then Salahuddin rahmatullah went on the battlefield and it was as though nothing had happened. Finally, the crusaders after two years, the Muslims in Acre asked for terms. Richard gave them two terms. And then after that, he butchered every man, woman and child in Acre. And then they marched by the coast and they came to Jerusalem. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah they took an oath, allegiance upon death from his men upon the rock. Ibn Shaddad mentioned that when Jerusalem was besieged, Salahuddin wouldn't sleep all night. He would beg him to sleep, he wouldn't sleep. Because his love for the holy lands was past any imagination. And Ibn Shaddad says, I met him at Fajr, he hadn't slept all night. And I said, oh Salahuddin, it is a holy day, it's Friday. Why don't you give some sadaqah secretly and then at Jummah between the Adhan and the Kama pray two rakats and ask Allah for assistance. And he mentions that day I was sitting next to Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi and he prayed the two rakats and then he began to cry and he was making dua. He was saying, he said, oh Allah, all my own resources I have exhausted in assisting your deen. And the only thing I have left is that I turn to you and I hold on to your rope and I ask you for your fadl and your grace. And Ibn Shaddad mentioned, I saw Salahuddin cry until his beard became drenched. And then the mat in front of him became wet. He cried and he cried. The next morning the news came that the crusaders had lifted their siege. And Richard had said his famous statement, as long as a man like Salahuddin is protecting Jerusalem, you will never take it. And then it was Richard who asked for a truce. Salahuddin never asked for a truce. Salahuddin didn't want a truce. The truce took place and Balian said in the awe of Salahuddin, he said, Oh Salahuddin, you have achieved something in Islam that nobody before you has achieved. He said 600,000 crusaders came and only one in 10 returned. Some died out of natural causes, some drowned, but he said the vast majority of Salahuddin you killed. And it was almost as though Allah had kept Salahuddin alive just for that period. After the truce, Salahuddin went back to Damascus. And the narration mentioned that one wet day he went to visit the Hajis. And when he came back, it was cold, it's wet. He became ill. And every day his state got worse. And Ali Maad mentioned, I was with Salahuddin when he was ill. By Allah, every time Salahuddin became more ill, it was as though his trust in the Rahm of Allah just increased. He said the weaker his body got, the stronger his trust in Allah became. And even in that state, Salahuddin couldn't go to the masjid anymore. But he insisted on praying Salah with Jama'ah. And they would bring an Imam. They would help him up and he would pray Salah in Jama'ah. And Shaykh Jafar mentioned that I was reciting the Quran by his bed. And when I reached the verses, Wallahu la ilaha illahu. Alimul Ghaybi wa Shahad. He it is Allah and no Lord besides Him, the knower of the unseen. He said, Salahuddin had been unconscious for a while, and I heard a faint voice saying, Sahih, He has spoken the truth. And he mentioned, For three days I recited the Quran by the bed of Salahuddin. And he said, On the final day when he passed away, I reached the verse, La ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkaltu. There is no God but Allah and upon Him I trust. And I saw Salahuddin's face become radiant and he recited the Shahada and he left this dunya. And Ibn Shaddad mentioned that this was the greatest calamity to befall the Muslims since the demise of the Khulafai Rashidun. And Abdul Latif, the famous physician says that he was mourned like a prophet because everybody loved him. The good loved him, the bad loved him, the Muslim loved him, the non-Muslims loved him. Everybody loved Salahuddin. And what did this king leave behind him? King of Egypt, king of Syria, Lebanon, Yemen. What did he leave behind him? He left one dinar and 47 dirhams, some armor and a horse. This is all he left behind him. They had to borrow money for his janazah. But I'll tell you what he left behind him. He left a legacy behind him. Ibn Shaddad was the closest man to Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi. He was the biographer of Salahuddin. The day Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi passed away was the day that he finished the biography of Salahuddin. He mentioned that one day I was traveling with Salahuddin and Salahuddin turned to me and he said, Oh Ibn Shaddad, there are people in the dunya to whom 
dust and wealth is the same. And Ibn Shaddad said, I knew that he was speaking about himself because he didn't care about the dunya. And how was Salahuddin buried? They had to borrow money for a janazah. And Qadi Fadil gave a fatwa that Salahuddin should be buried with his sword. So that on the day of judgment when he's resurrected and one of the seven people who is under the shade of Allah is Imam Adilun, a just ruler. When he's under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is leaning upon his sword. So everybody sees that this is the liberator of the holy land. This was the man who flung open the gates of fortresses and castles of the Christians one after the other. And on his tomb they wrote, O oh Allah, as his final victory, open for him the gates of Jannah. I think I'm Salah Hadin, Ali Yuba, conquer Palestine, then make me a mover. The kingdom of heaven is now the kingdom of hell, thanks to them terrorists and illegal settlers, straight out of Israel. I call for revolution, intifada, start me in Syria, then send me to Gaza, from the city where either you pray for the victory or scream, bury me a martyr, screaming how can we possibly be defeated, imma nasro, imma shahada. And we will never leave until we achieve what we chase after Until we free the holy city from the hands of such tyranny and disaster Until we bring back peace to these streets and finally set it free Masjid Al-Aqsa I mean how can we treat our blood as cheap when our blood is worth more than the Kaaba? Worth the believers to be like one body whether you're rich or poor the slave or the master For this is what he preached our leader Muhammad Peace be upon he, his family and his sahaba So don't ever be deceived to believe that you're alone Cause we haven't forgotten ya Even if you're beyond the F-16s, Apaches, drones and these helicopters Let these oppressors and volley me know No matter how high your weaponry and rockets are Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah the Almighty will forever be on top of ya. And Allah is all we need, for we need no leaders, nor any powers. Allah is sufficient for us to take back what is ours, from the hands of such cowards. Hiding behind walls and fortified towers, leaving a city under siege and under constant missile showers. Is this the only democracy in the Middle East that you are so proud of? Leaving these children plain as it rains, white phosphorus powder. Try to silence them with violence, but their cries are only getting louder and clearer towards the all hearer. For when we call upon He, we are only getting nearer. So don't ever fall to say that Allah is ignoring us. For it's for sure he's calling us to take heed to his speech in his holy Qur'an, the most glorious. In Tansurullah, Yunsurukum, give victory to Allah and you are guaranteed to be victorious. Support his cause and he will be supporting us. Hold firm to him and his messenger, he is informing us to give what you can from your wealth and yourself and know that at every step he is recording us. So fear your bad deeds more than your enemies. Ahmad bin Khattab, he was warning us. These are the wise words of men who were worshippers by night, but by day they were warriors who taught us to seek honor through Islam and Allah, He will honor us. So do not go astray and we will be saved from being humiliated Seek to please he and not whom he created Hold firmly to his rope and know not to be separated Bow down solely to Allah and no partners associated This is the formula for success if only we would take it We would see the victory we love and for so long we have waited so if you don't pray, start today and know that this is the only way we can make it. For he who stands before he, how can his feet possibly be shaken? 
For we the ones who fear none but one So whatever comes we remain patient Patiently praying for your promise Allah to hasten And when it comes let la ilaha illallah Be my final statement But until then Allah we are at your service and station So let Muhammad peace be upon he know that his nation is about to awaken La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu kunu ansar Allah